Good afternoon and welcome to Spirit of New Ministries. I'm Pastor Charles Young. A blessed new year to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining me for our Wednesday Bible study. We're back again with the Word of God and we're getting ready to open up a brand new topic in our Bible study series. Tonight we're going to be talking about something that everybody should be able to gain some understanding from in order that we might be about the business of kingdom building. And so we're going to begin with a word of prayer and then we're going to dive into our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this glorious day and this brand new year that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And we pray now that as we are now in a new year, Lord, that you would bring new revelation, new understanding as we study your word. Teach us that we might learn of thee that we might become more like you. For that, O oh God, we give you our thanks and our praise. And it's this prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, God bless you. Welcome. Good to have you with me this afternoon as we open up God's Word. We are studying a, starting a brand new study, and that study is entitled Blessed Obedience. Blessed Obedience. And as we talk about obedience, we're going to dig into the Word of God. We're going to see what God's perspective is on obedience, how we ought to address it, and how we ought to apply it to our living. Now, unfortunately, so many people look at the word obedience and they start to kind of shudder or they get a little down in their spirit or a little dejected because oftentimes people will equate obedience to a negative point of view or a negative perspective. Some people feel diminished when they think about obedience or feel that it's something that's demeaning. But in all reality, when we look at obedience from God's perspective, it's really refreshing and it's really liberating because as we live in obedience to the Word of God and to the will of God, God then opens up so many opportunities and possibilities to us as children of God. So I hope that this will be a blessing to you. I'm excited about this. I've been doing a lot of research and I want to give this information to you for your benefit. And so we're going to dig right in. And typically as we do, we usually do a chronological study of the scriptures beginning in the Old Testament and going into New Testament. So all of our scriptures this evening will be from the Old Testament. We're going to begin with the book of Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, chapter 15 we're going to look at verse 22 all of our passages will be from the English Standard Version and the very first thing that we want to do tonight is we want to look at God's perspective on obedience God does have a perspective and we need to be able to understand what his perspective is in order that we may gain full understanding and then be able to apply that to our living for our benefit and to God's glory. So as we go to 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, as we look at verse 22, there it reads, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. And here Samuel was making the, <coughs> excuse me, making the declaration that this whole issue of obedience and how we approach it and what God's perspective is on it is extremely significant. It's very vital in our understanding. And Samuel asked the question, and he puts it in perspective as he says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, does God get as much joy, does he get as much satisfaction in the burnt offerings and the sacrifices that we present before him? And that was 
the Old Testament passage talking about burnt offerings and sacrifices and in our New Testament reality, the things that we offer up to God. Are those things really satisfying to God? Are they more pleasing to God than obedience to the Word and to the voice of God? And so here the comparison is being made, is God more pleased with the things that we offer up to Him and our sacrifices, uh, uh, the things that we give of our time and of our energy uh, and of our resource versus obedience. And here, as Samuel makes that declaration via question, the answer is, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. In other words, it is much, much better to be obedient to the Word of God, to the will of God, to the voice of God, than it is to just try to offer things up in order to appease God or to try to satisfy Him in our disobedience. Our disobedience is always not pleasing before God. Our disobedience is always that which causes God's heart to break. And God wants obedience. He desires, He demands obedience in order that it really is a reflection of, of our relationship and our trust in God. When we're obedient to God, that's saying, God, I trust you. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, and it really doesn't matter because I know that you've got it covered. And so this whole issue that Samuel raises helps us to understand that obedience is more satisfying, more pleasing, more desirous of God than anything that we can offer up in our, uh, in our sacrifices before Him. You know, there's a quote from Stephen Furtick, who is the pastor of the Elevation Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he says, obedience is your responsibility, the outcome is God's. And there is so much truth to that, that our responsibility is to be obedient. No matter what the circumstance is, no matter what the situation is, our responsibility unto God is to be obedient. The outcome to that obedience is God's responsibility. And God is never, ever, ever going to fall short on His end of the situation. He is always going to come through. He's always going to, to provide those things that we are in need of, and all we have to do is be obedient. And so another passage of Scripture I want to call your attention to uh, is out of the book of Genesis. And we're going to go to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and now we're going to look at creation's response in obedience to God. Creation response and responds in obedience to God. Again, everything in creation ought to operate and respond in obedience, whether it's humanity or whether it's the creative order that God has established. All of God's creation, animate and inanimate, responds in obedience to God. And we see this out of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And there in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, notice what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. God spoke it, and it came to pass. In the very beginning, when the earth was without form, when it was void, when it was just uh, really nothing there in terms of any kind of form or fashion of the world, God spoke into it, and he spoke, let there be light, and there was light. And so even in creation, creation responds in obedience to God. When you go to Genesis, the 6th and 7th verse of that first chapter, there it says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, 
and separated the waters that were under the expanse and the waters that were above it, and it was so. God spoke it, and humanity res or, and creation responded to God's declaration, and it came to pass. We see that again in verse 11. Again, Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, and each according to its kind on the earth again, and it was so. These very things that God had spoken into being, he spoke it, and it came to pass. Again, in verse 24 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. I gave you all of those passages to demonstrate and reflect that the very thing that God created responds to him in obedience. This world, this earth that we have, God created it, and when God speaks a thing, it has to respond in God's obedience and in obedience to the very things that God declares. And we see that out of all of what God created, all of his creation responds to him in obedience. And then when we look to another passage of Scripture, we're going to see how God speaks to the Israelites regarding obedience. So we see, first of all, that God is serious about obedience, and then even his creation responds to him in obedience. And so now he's speaking to his beloved people, the Israelites, with respect to obedience. And here when we look at Leviticus, the 26th chapter, and Leviticus is one of those books that's included in what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law books. And here what we see in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, we're going to look at verses 3 through 13. And as we do so, what we're going to see is how God deals with the Israelites and how he deals with them with respect to obedience. Beginning at verse 3, Leviticus 26, there it reads, If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshings shall last from the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing. And you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land securely." And just to kind of stop at these first few verses here, it talks about how if the children of Israel walk in the very commandments of God and observe those commandments, God will do some things for them. He will allow the rains to come. He will allow the land to produce its increase. And he will allow the benefit of their labor to be realized. They will be able to eat their bread in full, and they will be able to dwell in the land securely. These are the same principles that God allowed the children of Israel to have, the same principles that he allows us to be the beneficiaries of even today. If we're obedient to the word of God, God will provide. If we're obedient to his word and obedient to his voice, God will make provisions that will allow us to live securely in the land. When you go to verse 6, it says, I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. Again, he's talking about security, and all of this comes on the heels of us walking in obedience. These are divine promises that God makes to his people because God never falls short of his word. He says at also in that sixth verse, he says that I will remove harmful beasts from the land and the sword will not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand and your enemies 
shall fall before you by the sword. And this just reflects God's promise, how God provides in the midst of chaos, in the midst of tragedy, how God will settle your enemies before you, how God will provide a realm of peace in the midst of your enemies. He goes on to say in verse 9, he said, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. Now, beloved, do not miss that because the God that we serve is a covenantal God. He is the God of promise. He is the God who enters into covenant with his people. And when God does that, he keeps his side of the covenant. All we have to do is to keep our side. And this is the obedience that God calls for. This is the obedience that drives our relationship with God in order that he would open the windows of heaven and provide blessings for us untold. He goes on to say, I will turn to you and will make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store, you shall eat old store long kept and you shall clear out the old and make way for the new. He's talking about provisions. He'll make sure that you have what you need. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Again, that is relationship. That is that covenant bond that God has with his people. He will dwell with us, and he will make his residence with us, and there will be earnest relationship between God and his people contingent upon the obedience of his people. Verse 12, I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. Once again, relationship, that covenant. In essence, God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He will be with us always, and he makes that covenant agreement, and that's contingent upon our obedience. He goes on to say, I am the Lord your God, verse 13, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. In other words, you are no longer slaves, but I'm breaking you out of your bondage and I'm allowing you to walk upright and allowing you to have the liberty that was designed for you to have. The same God that spoke those words to the Israelites is the same God that in Christianity wants us as Christians to be the beneficiaries of these blessings. But they're contingent upon obedience. All things rest upon the precipice of obedience. And then when you look to the book of Deuteronomy, again in Deuteronomy, we're going to look at chapter 4 and verses 39 and 40. Two powerful verses. Here it says, Know therefore today, and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. And so what we have here, once again, is a covenantal promise. And here God is saying, hear this today, lay it to your heart that the Lord is the God of heaven above and the earth beneath, and there is no other. In other words, we are not to submit to surrender or to give ourselves over to other gods. There is one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the creator of all heaven and earth, and the one who provides salvation through his son, Christ Jesus. There is none other. He is the God of the heavens above. He is the God of the earth beneath, and we should have no other God before him. He says, if we do that, he said, he shall keep his statutes. If we are to keep his statutes and his commandments that he commands us today, he says that all would go well with us and for our children after us. 
And he was saying to the Israelites that all will go well for you if you walk in obedience. If you have no other God but the God of heaven and earth, uh, then you will go, things will go well with you. And not only will things go well with you, but they will also go well with your children after you, which that speaks to generational blessings. That means blessings not only to your generation, but also to the next generation that comes behind you. God is a generational God, and he provides these blessings contingent upon our obedience, not only to us, but also to our children. And when we read further in Scripture, it talks about how the blessings fall to our children and our children's children. And so what we find is that God is also the multi-generational God of blessings. And he goes on to say that you may prolong your days in the land of the Lord that the Lord your God is giving you for all time, that the blessings would never end. And beloved, that's the same God that speaks to us today, that in our blessings, in our obedience, God wants to provide. He has the means to provide. He has the desire to provide for us on a multi-generational basis. And all of that is contingent upon our obedience. We also look to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and we look at verse 18. Again, this also confirms what we just read out of Deuteronomy 4, 39 and 40. Here in verse 18 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, that you may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Once again, we see here generational blessings. The land that God had sworn to their fathers, he says, I will bring that to pass in your lifetime. I will give this land to you that I swore and I promised by covenant promise to your fathers, to your ancestors. It's now going to fall to you. And so God is speaking this over and over and over to the children of Israel. And in same fashion, he wants to speak that same spirit into us. That if we walk in obedience, God promises to provide the blessings of this season. He provides the blessings of this time in which we live. And he allows those blessings to fall to our next generation that comes behind us. He says... And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Now, there is the premise. And there is the premise of what needs to happen for the blessings to flow. The premise is that we shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. God is the one who makes the determination. It's not what is good and what is right in the sight of man. Because what's good and what's right in the sight of man can change from day to day. There's no consistency. What's good one day is not good the next day. And what wasn't good one day, now it becomes good. And we see that in our living today. That there are principles and precepts that were not good at one time. Oh, but now they're good. It's now okay to, to do a certain thing or to live a certain way. And we see that that changes. It, 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 it vacillates. But God is the God who never changes. He is the God that is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He is the God who always remains the same. And so what's good and what is right in the eyesight of the Lord is that which we ought to operate out of on a daily, on a daily basis. And he says, if we do that, the promise is that it will go well with us. In other words, that God will start to open the door of blessings for us, for our family, and for our generation. And then when you continue to move on, now we're going to go to the book of Joshua. And now, as God is transitioning the children of Israel from the promised land and going into, or from uh, the plains of Moab, they're going into the promised land. Moses now dies, and now Joshua is the one who God raises up to take Moses' place. And so now God is speaking 
to Joshua, and he now, just as he did with the children of Israel, and just as he did with respect to creation, he lays obedience as the premise out of which people are to operate and things are to happen. And so the same way that he did with creation and the same way that he laid out the principle of obedience to the children of Israel, he now lays it out for Joshua. And again, what we are seeing is God's perspective with obedience. Obedience is not that which can be compromised or to be looked upon lightly. If we want to walk in the blessing flow of God, we need to recognize that God is, number one, serious about obedience, and number two, he wants us to walk in obedience. He commands that we walk in obedience. And for us not to do so sets us up for negative things in our lives. And he now shares this with Joshua. So now the final point that I want to share with you tonight is God gives instructions to Joshua, and these instructions are with respect to obedience. Look at what he says in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Beginning at verse 1, it declares, After the death of Moses, the servant of God, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' his assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Every place that your soul, of the soul that your foot will trod upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. What God is doing is he's outlining the area, the geography of where the children of Israel will then have this land that will be theirs. And he's saying to Joshua, everywhere within this border that you go, this land is yours. He says in verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tr- uh, that you shall, shall that every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. So here, once again, we have God promising this to Moses, and just as God promised it to Moses, He's now promising it to Joshua, and He's saying, even the land of the Hittites, I'm going to give it to you. This land that now is possessed and belongs to somebody else, I'm going to rid them of this land and I'm going to give it to you. God is the God who is able to open doors of opportunity and provision that we cannot do ourselves, all contingent upon our obedience. Look down to verse 5. It says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you with you. And that is God's comfort of letting us know that he is with us. That is his confirmation. That is his affirmation, along with his comfort of letting us know that just as God was with Moses, he would also be with Joshua. Just as he was with Joshua and all the other prophets and all of the other great people of the Bible, God is also with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Lo, he is with us always, even until the very end. He says, I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very create courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Now, here he's saying, obey the law. Make sure that you adhere to the very thing that I gave to Moses. Make sure that you adhere to the same law. In other words, be obedient to my word. Do not stray from it. Make sure that you adhere to the word. Because look at what he goes on to say. He says, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This success 
is God's desire for the child of God. As we walk in obedience, God makes the promise, I will provide for you that which you can't provide for yourself. I will open doors for you that you can't open for yourself. I will give you lands and I will make provisions for you that you cannot provide for yourself. And it's all contingent upon your obedience. God has the resource. God has the capability. And he wants for his people to be blessed. And we see this in the experience with Joshua and the children of Israel. He says, no matter where you go, I've provided success for you. Make sure that you don't go to the right or to the left, but you stay laser focused on my word and you adhere to my word continuously. He says in verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. In essence, there's two times that we need to focus on the word of God. That's day and night. In other words, there should never be a time that we're not focusing on the word of God. And in this, God makes his declarative promise. He makes his covenantal promise. He says, the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. Take time to study it. Take time to roll it over in your mind, roll it over in your heart, roll it over in your spirit. And to do this day and night, in other words, continuously, when you go through the day, have God's word on your mind. When you come to the evening hour, have God's word on your mind. When you lay down at night, have God's word on your mind. And I declare that the word of God will sow seed in your spirit even while you're sleeping. When you wake up in the morning, you'll find yourself even more refreshed because you went to bed with God's word on your mind and God will wake you up with his word on your mind. He goes on to say, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Not some of it, not just the things that we think we can do or the things that, that seem convenient or the things that, that we feel like we can accomplish. He says we ought to commit ourselves, be careful to do according to all that is written in his word. And what that means is, is that God is the God is not going to give us something that we don't have the capability to accomplish. If he says, I want you to adhere to all my word, then he gives us the wherewithal, he gives us the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit to do all things through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which means I can adhere, I can obey all of God's word. He goes on and he says, for then... You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I don't know about you, but I want to have good success. I want to have good success in my personal life, in my professional life, in my ministry life. I want to have good success in my marriage. I want to have good success uh, in my teaching, in my declaration of God's word, in my ministry, in my administration. I want to have good success in every area of my life. And so I know the only way that that can happen is I have to walk in obedience. And that's why he says here in verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Now, why would God have to tell Joshua this? He tells him this because he knows that Joshua is going to face some trials. He's getting ready to take over for Moses. It's his uh, responsibility to get the people into the promised land because Moses was not able to go into the promised land. And so now that was Joshua's responsibility. He was now going to be the leader of the people and the servant of the people. And beloved, all of us have that leader servant responsibility in our lives. And because of that, there's going to be challenges that we're going to face. It is an absolute certainty that as Christians, as we live our lives in this day and time, we are going to face some challenges. If we think that we're going to walk through this Christian life or float through this Christian life without challenge, without trial, without going through some turmoil, without getting our hands dirty, we're just fooling ourselves. We are going to face some challenges and some trials. Jesus said it. 
He says, as I suffer in like manner, ye also are going to suffer. We ought to consider it a privilege to suffer for the cause of Christ. And so in doing so, God equips us with being able to walk victoriously and successfully in the midst of those trials. So we need to gird up our loins. We need to kind of dust ourselves off, stiffen our chin, straighten up our back, and know that we're going to walk through this thing with the power of the Holy Spirit as we stand on the Word of God, as God continues to lead us with His powerful hand. And so he says, do not be frightened and don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He says that to Joshua, and that same word is a word for us today. God says, don't be afraid, do not be dismayed, for our God is with us wherever we go. And that's a means of obedience. Not to be afraid, not to be dismayed, but to recognize that God is with us always. And then our final passage for the night is also out of the book of Joshua, but now we're going to drop down to chapter 22. And in Joshua chapter 22, we're going to look at verse 5, and there it reads, Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. In other words, he's saying it's time to be sold out for the Lord. Follow him with all your heart, with all your soul. Cling to him. Follow his commandments. Do all of what his commandments say in order that it might go well with us. And God promises that if we do so, that he will never leave us, never forsake us, that he will provide our every need. And not only provide the need, but he'll exceed the need. And in doing so, we walk in obedience to the very pleasure and to the very glory of the God we serve. Beloved, I pray that this information has been helpful for you. I hope that it helps to encourage your heart and inspire your spirit. That when we, we walk in obedience, there is a blessedness that God provides in our lives and to our circumstances as we live in the obedience of an almighty and all-loving God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for this new study about blessed obedience. Father, I'm praying that you would bless your people, that you would strengthen them, gird up their loins, encourage their hearts, and inspire their spirits to walk in obedience according to thy word, and in doing so, that they might develop a stronger and more fervent relationship with you. For this, O oh God, we give you our thanks and our praise, and it's this prayer that we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, and God bless you. Again, thank you for joining me here at Spirit of New Ministries. We'll see you next time. Prayerfully, I pray that you join us on Sunday morning at 1015. Uh, as we celebrate God and as we lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, we'll see you back here again on next Wednesday for our Bible study entitled Blessed Obedience. God bless you. See you next time.